CNN is excited to introduce their brand new show, Gaslight, which promises to bring you an entirely different world of news than the world we're actually living in. According to program notes used to clean a toilet seat in an airport restroom, Gaslight will be shown Sundays through Saturdays from 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. and will feature an exciting new array of hosts who will be exactly the same hosts as before, except called new. On the first episode of Gaslight, new host Chris Cuomo will take an in-depth look at the peaceful protesters peacefully being peaceful in the midst of cities around the nation that just happen to be on fire for some reason. Chris will explain why the peaceful protesters are absolutely right to peacefully drive their car over the bodies of policemen and peacefully hammer the heads of unarmed women with two by fours while other peaceful protesters stand by peacefully laughing. After all, who doesn't enjoy a good laugh? Next on Gaslight, new host Anderson Cooper will bring on expert guest Looney McGabble, retired four-star general from the nation of Imaginaria. General McGabble will explain how at any moment Donald Trump could unleash nuclear attacks against the peaceful protesters with assistance from flying saucers from the planet Gildar. General McGabble says he has high-level sources from Gildar in radio communication with him through the fillings in his molars. And while some citizens may think they're under threat from violent looters and rioters, if they could hear the voices he hears, they'd know the real danger is Donald Trump, not the peaceful protester, repeatedly backing over them with an SUV. And of course, new host Don Lemon will also be part of Gaslight. Lemon will deliver a very special half hour of staring into the camera with damp, doe-like eyes and a very serious expression, and then passionately mouthing non sequiturs in an important sounding voice. The evening will end with anchorwoman Shapely Nudnik, who'll probably be saying something or other while you stare at her sweater. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship-shaped, tipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hurrah. All right. I hope you have subscribed to my personal Andrew Clavin YouTube channel, which has got all my opens in them and exclusive content. You know, you guys were doing a great job and we were uh, getting past Michael Knowles's channel. And now he started to catch up. I'm sure he has paid Russian bots and things, you know, signing up to his YouTube channel. So I please, I mean, here's a comment. We've been tracking your comments. And here's a comment from uh, Naru Hotel, who says, not only did I subscribe to the Andrew Clavin YouTube channel, I unsubscribed from Michael's channel all in the name of saving the Clavin and having my comment featured in tomorrow's episode. That'll work every time because we do not want Knowles having more subscribers on his uh, YouTube channel than we do. So if you've ever wondered why Donald Trump was so easily able to sweep aside a large number of prominent Republicans in the last presidential primaries, you only have to look at the statement released yesterday by former President George W. Bush. It is full of weak sauce, virtue signaling and gobbledygook about how racist our society is without a single word that I could see condemning rioters who have trashed cities around the country. That's the GOP Trump replaced, a broken organization that has been talked into nonsense by the left. Our news media is obviously broken, too. The Democrats are not only broken themselves, they're the cause of breakage in others. In fact, right now, there is only one organization in the country who is, that is trying to do what needs to be done, and that's the nation's police. Taken as a group, taken as an organization, only the nation's police oppose the use of undue force by both their fellow officers and the protesters. Only the police enforce the law that allows peaceful protest and the law against violent riots and looting. You can't have rule of law only for one side. The police enforce them both when they're doing their job right. As a group, as an organization, only the police take action every day to improve the lives of our black citizens by keeping them safe from the criminals who routinely prey on them. And only they are working to improve their methods and keep wrongful killings low, plans which have been working and reducing such killings for the last five years. I don't do race. By which I mean I don't believe we should create racial policies or even regard humans according to race. That's the American position, and it's also the Christian position. The church has abandoned that Christian position. They're telling white people who never did anything 
be, to apologize because they're white to black people who haven't suffered anything because they're black. Or maybe they have suffered anything, but not at the hands of the white people apologizing. So the church has abandoned the Christian position, as we know. So has the news media. They've abandoned it, too. And the Democrats have. And for the most part, the Republicans have because they're just too scared to stick to the truth. But the best police forces in this country, when they're doing their job right, they just go where the crime is, white or black, even knowing they'll be accused of racism because there's more black crime. Cops are the last rung on the sociological ladder. They are there when everyone else has failed. If there are problems with the police in black communities, and I know there are, they have their origins elsewhere above the police. Broken families, drugs, years of race baiting by Chris Cuomo on CNN, fake news. Maybe our priests and pals should do something about those things. After all, the best of our police are only trying to handle the fallout of the failures of the rest of us. All right, let us talk for a moment about Eero. I love talking about Eero because I've had it in my house for years, long before they became sponsors. It boosts your Wi-Fi so that you can get it all over the house. It's the Wi-Fi from Eero that your home deserves. It blankets your whole home with fast, reliable Wi-Fi, and not just inside, but outside too. I have a writing uh, booth outside, and I use it out there as well. Eero extends your coverage so you, you can enjoy the nicer weather and get work done from your deck. Eero eliminates poor coverage, dead spots, and buffer. You'll have a consistently strong signal wherever you need it. Eero sets up in minutes, plugging right into your modem or modem router box. It really, it's just great. You know, I mean, it's just that you can just set it up and suddenly if you are having these dead zones, they go away. You can get yours fixed as soon as tomorrow. Go to Eero.com slash Andrew. Enter code Andrew at checkout to get free next day shipping with your order. That's E-E-R-O dot com slash Andrew. Code Andrew at checkout to get your Eero delivered with free next day shipping. You must use this URL to receive this offer, Eero.com slash Andrew, code Andrew. It really is good. It works, works terrific. You know, I'm calling these now the Tara Reid riots, all right? I, I said a long time ago, and I keep hammering at this because it's just so true, that Tara Reid told us everything we need to know, not about Joe Biden. We don't know whether she's telling the truth about Joe Biden, but told us everything we need to know about the press, right? When the way they covered Christine Blasey Ford in hysteria, making sure that anybody who said anything without any provenance whatsoever, attacking Brett Kavanaugh, was given plenty of news coverage. And then Tara Reid buried. 19 days, she made accusations against Joe Biden, didn't cover it. That tells you everything you need to know about the atmosphere of information that all of us are living in. We're all affected by it. And our politicians are affected by it. That's why the GOP trembles in their uh, shoes. That's why they come out against Trump when it would be more helpful for them to support Trump or just keep their mouths shut. You know, this is this is why it, the demonstrations we have. We have. Let me ask you this. All, all the day yesterday, all we heard was uh, these demonstrations are mostly peaceful. They're mostly peaceful. OK, this is Tara Reid reasoning. They're mostly peaceful. We see cities burning down. We see stores looted. We see cops hurt, killed. Cops are killed. But they're mostly peaceful. But we get one bad police killing. And I admit, you know, George Floyd, an atrocious police killing the guys in custody. He should be in custody. We have to have him tried. We have to find out what he did. Why does that not make the police mostly non-racist? Or why, why do we assume that his motives were racist? Why do we assume if a black man commits a crime, he didn't commit that crime because he's black? Of course he didn't, right? But if a white cop commits a crime or does something bad, he must have done it because he's a racist white guy. Why do we assume that? That is Tara Reid reasoning. We're getting it all over in every possible way. If these protests are mostly peaceful, then the police are mostly non-racist. But they're selling a they're selling a narrative all the time. What about the killings by cops as opposed to killings by criminals? You know, uh, there was a, a guy, a retired police captain, uh, David Dorn in St. Louis, he was 77. He had a part time job going out and checking on a store. He went to check on a store. He was shot dead. NBC didn't even cover it. He, he was a black guy. Trump tweeted about him. Why doesn't his life matter? So it's only black. This Black Lives Matter is a scam. It's a scam. Just like just like Christine Blasey Ford was a scam. It's all all narrative. And that's what's burning your cities. That narrative is burning your cities. All right, let us take a look at, uh, at this some more. Uh, you know, one of the big arguments, and I, and I understand this argument. I have sympathy for this argument. By the way, I should tell you, we have the mailbag, uh, the peaceful mailbag coming up, which will set your city on fire with wisdom. Uh, and I, 
In that mailbag, I will address your comments about our, my interview with Jonah Goldberg. I know a lot of you were angry that I didn't beat up on him. Uh, a lot of people wrote in, so I will read one of those letters and, and address that. Um, you know, one of the arguments that uh, that black Americans have that I understand is, is the lived experience of being a black man with the police, right? You have this lived experience, as I'm using there, the left's phrase for this, the lived experience. So in other words, a black guy, and I hear this from black conservatives, I hear it from black leftists, they're much more likely to get stopped by the police and it's humiliating. And, you know, if you're an honest guy, a member of your community, a businessman, a senator, doesn't matter, you're getting stopped by the police. And it's tough. It's, it's bad. And I understand that. Now, I know a guy who's a bigot. I've told you this before. I know a couple of guys who are bigots and I get in arguments with them and I say to them, you know, they say to me, who am I going to get mugged by? I'm going to get mugged by a black guy. Who's going to rob my store? It's going to be a black guy. Who causes all the problems in America is a black guy. And I say, well, OK, but, you know, there's behind that statistic, there are sociological and historical reasons. And they say to me, what do I care? What do I care? I just don't want to be mugged. What do I care? In other words, it's their lived experience that they're under threat from black people more. That's their lived experience. That's why women get nervous in an elevator when a black guy walks in, because that's their lived experience. So I'm asking these friends or acquaintances who are racist, I'm asking them to go beyond their lived experience to get at the truth, to get at the reasons for their lived experience, because you can have any kind of lived experience. You know, you can live in a place where there's a nasty Jewish guy and think, well, my ex lived experience is that, I, you know, I don't like Jews. Of course you can. We all have lived experiences, but we don't extrapolate from those experiences. The left tells us that if you're a woman and you would like to have a baby and have make a home for that baby and make a home for your husband, You've been brainwashed. Your lived experience of desire and yearnings, that, that doesn't matter. You've been brainwashed. So why is the lived experience of black people to be taken as proof of what they think it's proof of? It's the narrative they're reacting to. And we know this narrative is being sold to us by a group of left wingers and dopes. This is another thing. I think we have to count stupidity in. I keep saying leftism, 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 but leftism may just be a symptom of stupidity. It really may. I mean, I, I talk about it as a symptom of decay. I think leftism is a symptom of decay when you are building a country. Everybody's conservative because everybody knows the rules. You're all hanging on. You've got the gods of the copybook headings are in operation. But once you get rich, once you get successful, it's like, how come he has more money than I do? Give me some of his money. There's a lot of stupidity that involved. So speaking of stupidity, Chris Cuomo goes on and Chris Cuomo is doing everything he can to incite a riot. And this is what he said. This is cut six. Too many see the protests as the problem. No, the problem is what forced your fellow citizens to take to the streets. Persistent and poisonous inequities and injustice. And please show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite. And peaceful, because I can show you that outraged citizens are the ones who have made America what she is and led to any major milestones. Be honest, this is not a tranquil time. I'm smart, not like everybody <laughs> says. <laughs> he said, Show me where protests are supposed to be peaceful. The First Amendment grants you the right of the people peaceably to assemble. There it is, Chris. Now you know. It's like I showed it to you. It's in the Constitution that you're supposedly protecting. And the idea, you know, the civil rights movement succeeded because of Martin Luther King. That's why the civil rights movement succeeded. It succeeded because white people in America looked at those peaceful marches and looked at the dogs being set on the peaceful marchers. And they said, you know what? These guys have a point. These guys have a point. We got to think about this. And white people, as, as Shelby Steele has written repeatedly, white people accepted the shame and made a change. It's the left. It's the left that hasn't accepted that that change has been made. And it obviously has. It obviously has. And when you say, you know, they're allowed to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress, what redress are they looking for? You know, police are desperate to try and uh, modernize their police techniques to May give them better neighborhood policing. That is what they're trying to do. What is their what is their program? Their people showed up at uh, Eric Garcetti, the mayor of L.A.'s house. A mob showed up outside his house demanding that he defund the police. John Legend, the musician, and Megan Rapinoe, the soccer star, they signed a defund the police letter. Well, what I would like, how about we defund the police in neighborhoods that vote to defund the police and in neighborhoods where we support the police, we get those funds. We get double the funds. How about that? What the hell do you think would happen if you defund the police? 
police. What on earth do you think would happen if the police aren't in your neighborhoods? Heather McDonald, who I hope will come on the show. Uh, I'm going to ask her to come on tomorrow if she has time. Uh, she wrote a piece in The Wall Street Journal, great piece about the myth of an systemic police racism. OK. And by the way, you know, pol- any cop will tell you there are bad cops. Any cop will tell you there are bad. Any good cop will tell you, yeah, some of these guys should not be walking around with a bat. 800,000 of them, this population of San Francisco worth of police in this country, they're going to be bad cops. Nobody can imagine that magic that away. But here's what Heather says. She says, in 2019, police officers fatally shot 1,004 people, most of whom were armed or otherwise dangerous. African-Americans were about a quarter of those killed by cops last year, 235, a ratio that has remained stable since 2015. That share of black victims is less than what the black crime rate would predict since police shootings are a function of how often officers encounter armed and violent suspects. In 2018, the latest year for which such data have been published, African-Americans made up 53 percent of known homicide offenders in the U.S. and commit about 60 percent of robberies, though they are 13 percent of the population. This is what I was telling you on Monday, I think it was. The police fatally shot nine unarmed blacks and 19 unarmed and 19 unarmed whites in 2019 according to a Washington Post database, down from 38 and 32 respectively. So they've been working to get these shootings down. The Post defines unarmed broadly to include such cases as a suspect in Newark, New Jersey, who had a loaded handgun in his car during a police chase. In 2018, there were 7,407 black homicide victims. Assuming a comparable number of victims last year, those nine unarmed black victims of police shootings represent 0.1% of all African Americans killed in 2019. By contrast, a police officer is 18 and a half times more likely to be killed by a black male than an unarmed black male is to be killed by a police officer. So again, it's narrative. Why are these, um, these riots mostly peaceful? But it's not cops who are mostly in danger from bad guys in the black community. You know, this is, let me go on with Heather's thing. On Memorial Day weekend in Chicago alone, 10 African-Americans were killed in drive-by shootings. Such routine violence has continued. A 17-year-old, 72-year-old Chicago man shot in the face on May 29th by a gunman who fired about a dozen shots into a residence. Two 19-year-old women uh, and, and so on and so on being killed by blacks, black on black killings. Somebody on Twitter today said to me, you know, how many murders do you have to witness before you care? Saying to me, how many murders? Because I was saying that this atrocious killing of George Floyd doesn't prove systemic racism. How many murders? Well, how many murders do you have to see before you care? How many murders? Does it only here? Let's hear from some of the people, right? Let's hear from uh, this, this lady in the neighborhood. This is cut three. It's free reign. There's nobody at the checkout, but this just pulled a gun out on not just me, but five other black females. And y'all sitting up here really pretending like y'all did this over black lives. A black man who looks like me, who should be out there protecting me, just pulled a gun out on me and five other sisters. So y'all tell me, keep lying to yourself, talking about this is about black lives. So whose lived experience are we reporting? How about the lady whose store was trashed and she was talking about that? Twitter took that down, took that video down. No one's reposted it. But Twitter took took it down. Uh, this black lady saying her store was trashed. Whose lived experience are we talking about? It is all narrative. It is all selective narrative from the left, from the left. It's burning your cities. That's what's burning your cities. All right. Let us talk about um NetSuite, of course. What else? <laughs> when, we, when we are fighting to save our businesses, to keep our businesses alive in a time of crisis, you got to pay attention to what is going on. you got to know your numbers. you got to know the numbers in your business or you don't know what your business is, right? So what you need for this is NetSuite by Oracle. It's the world's number one cloud business system. Finance, HR, inventory, e-commerce, everything you need all in one place so you save time, money, and headaches. And whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in sales, NetSuite gives you visibility and control so you can manage every penny with precision. Join over 20,000 companies who trust NetSuite to go faster with confidence. NetSuite surveyed hundreds of business leaders and assembled a playbook. The top strategies they're using as America reopens for business. Receive your free guide, seven actions businesses need to take now, and schedule your free product tour at netsuite.com slash Clavin. Get your free guide and schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash 
Clavin. That's netsuite.com slash Clavin. If you're going to run a business, you have to know, obviously, how you spell Clavin. K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's in Clavin. I really just make it look this easy. Again, the mailbag is coming up and we'll address your Jonah Goldberg uh, (laughs) complaints. We'll have them over. Rest assured, by the way, if you think I'm treating people too nicely, we do have a team of heavies waiting outside. Anytime a guest comes on and disagrees with me, they just, uh, you know, they just belabor him about the head and shoulders. So, Let's look at some of our our leaders, our leadership, and how the narrative plays there. Uh, New York was utterly trashed. Midtown Manhattan, utter, utterly trashed. Here's Andrew Cuomo, who's who's still on the run from lawmakers. Uh, he's still on the run from law enforcement for his slaughter of old people uh, in their in their rest homes, uh, attacking Mayor Bill De Blasio for not doing enough. Let's cut nine. The NYPD and the mayor did not do their job last night. I believe that. Uh, Second, you have 38,000 NYPD people. It is the largest police department in the United States of America. Use 38,000 people and protect property. Use the police, protect property and people look at the videos it was a disgrace so th- this is uh, that is that's also a disgrace he's right he's right bill de blasio is maybe the worst mayor in america he's a, a just an awful awful mayor why Republicans don't think they can go into New York City and win with that being the mayor? I mean, I ask my liberal friends in New York, why are you voting for this guy? And they say he's the guy running. He's the you know, he's the he's the candidate. They don't choose the candidates. Right. They're going to work. They're doing their thing. Why aren't the Republicans in there running a mayor? Why don't they have a new uh, Giuliani who fixed that city the first time go in there and fix it again? It only took a couple of years for de Blasio to destroy it. However, however, who can call out the National Guard? Cuomo. Why doesn't he do it? Oh, well, you have enough people. If he's not doing it right, why not do it? He says he can replace the mayor. He says he can go in and override the mayor. Why doesn't he? He's got, you know, he, he's never to blame for anything, Andrew Cuomo. He is never to blame for anything. He wants all the power, but he wants none of the responsibility. All right. So that's that's them. And then you have the New York Times, a New York, a former newspaper, but a New York institution. This is the paper that cover is supposed to be covering the city and the nation. They the failing New York Times, Nicole which is like so bad. <laughs> They have Nicole Hannah-Jones, who I'm beginning to believe is one of the worst people in the country. Nicole Hannah-Jones is the author of that crazy 1619 project, which, of course, is becoming part of this narrative. Oh, 400 years of racism. Every time you hear that, every time you hear 400 years, that's 1619 they're talking about. Her make-believe history of America being founded to protect the institution of slavery, not true. It's just not factually true. And they had to rewrite it because it was not factually true, because all the historians said it. They rewrote it to suggest it's true, but not to say it's true. If you read it, it's now this mealy mouth garbage. So here's Nicole Hannah-Jones in leading in, in, in a leading New York institution, talking about her city her city, the New York Times of city, the city that is on the masthead of the paper, being trashed, being burned, the police being run over in the middle of the street. And here she is talking about this as a cut 11. It is disturbing to see property being destroyed. It is disturbing to see uh, people taking property from stores. But these are things. And violence is when an agent of the state kneels on a man's neck until all of the life is leached out of his body. Destroying property which can be replaced is not violence. And to put those things, uh, to use the exact same language to describe those two things, I think really um, it's not it's not moral to do that. What a n- what a nudnik. I mean, really, what an idiot. What an idiot. It's, the, the businesses are people's dreams. Those are houses are places where people live and they work. That's, the economy is part of people's lives. People are going to die from poverty because of this. They're going to die. You know, this is, this is another thing that's driving me absolutely nuts is that before, before this happened, 
It was a crime to take your kid to the park because we were all in so much danger. We we're all in so much danger from the Chinese flu. It was such, oh, the danger. Now suddenly it's like, yes, we have to go out there in your thousands with, you know, and shoulder to stand, shoulder to shoulder, and suddenly the problem doesn't matter. You want to talk about Tara Reid newscasting. You want to talk about ca- the Tara Reid journalism. That's it right there. Ted Cruz was calling them out for this, and well, he should. This is cut uh, eight. These Democratic politicians that are treating this as an excuse for partisan politics is really unfortunate. A lot of these authoritarians on the local level were quick to send in the police to arrest a dad for playing softball with his six-year-old daughter. Or to try to shut down a church that was daring to worship. But when you have violent protesters engage in, in physical assaults, Too many Democratic politicians are playing politics and allowing the riots to play forward. When you see a city council member in Minneapolis saying he supports Antifa while Antifa is literally burning the city to the ground, it is wrong. It's amazing. It is amazing. I mean, it's how long ago was it? It was 20 minutes ago that they were telling us how how terrible it was that people were that people were protesting Uber Stormfuhrer Gretchen Whitmer, uh, the governor of the Uber Stormfuhrer governor of uh, of Michigan. She has now pulled down the lockdown orders just like that, just like that. It was going to be, oh, it was going to be terrible. It's going to take forever. We've got to have a vaccine. We've got to stop death. Death has got to be knocked off his pale horse before Michigan can reopen. It's reopened. It's reopened. Why? Because, well, you know, she wanted to destroy the economy herself. But if the looters are going to do it for her, fine, fine. And (laughs) Bill de Blasio is out there. Listen to every time this guy opens his mouth. I just think like, is it bad to recommend tar and feathering the mayor? I mean, is that a bad thing to do? I don't want to become, you know, Kathy Griffith or anything like that. But really, is it bad? Listen to his excuse for why one thing is okay, But and listen to what he says is so so much less important. This is cut uh, 14. When you see a nation, an entire nation, simultaneously grappling with an extraordinary crisis seated in 400 years of American racism, I'm sorry, that is not the same question as the understandably aggrieved store owner or the devout religious person who wants to go back to services. This is something that's not about which side of the spectrum you're on. It's about a deep, deep American crisis. We have never seen anything quite like what we've seen in the last few days. This is a powerful, painful historical moment. It's, it's more important that people burn down my city, says Mayor Bill de Blasio, than that they pray in my city. I mean, you've got to be a major, major clown to think that. You have, got to, you have got to have an entire Volkswagen full of clowns driving around inside your head where your brain is supposed to be to think that bringing the city together in prayer is less important than bringing the city together to trash it, to trash it. Fifth Avenue is a mess. Their main shopping place is a mess. Where does he think where does he think the money is going to come for all his little plans? Where does he think the tax dollars are going to come? Where does he think the base is going to be? That city, you know, the Islamists couldn't destroy that city. New York is a tough town. The Islamists couldn't destroy that city by driving by blowing up the uh, World Trade Center. Bill de Blasio may succeed where they have failed. He may succeed where they have failed. Oh, but the worst thing of all, you know, you can always tell when Trump has done something effective by the incredible, incredible reaction of the press trying to suppress it. So Trump went and stood in front of a church and held up a Bible. Oh, what an evil thing this was. Here's just from our friends at the Media Research Center, uh, Newsbusters, uh, a little montage of that. This is cut five. Tear gas is used to clear demonstrators for a presidential photo op in front of a fire damaged church. Tear gas used on protesters in order to clear the way for the president to walk over from the White House across the street for this photo to hold up a Bible in front of a church that had been damaged in a fire. The Episcopal Bishop of D.C. blasting the president for what she called a photo op and saying she never gave him permission to be there. The outrage is growing after U.S. Park and Secret Service police fire tear gas and rubber bullets into a crowd of peaceful demonstrators near the White House, clearing the way for the president's photo op in front of historic St. John's Episcopal Church. Oh my God! <laughs> 
You know, I'm not going to pretend that Donald Trump is a saint or uh, even a religious guy. I don't I, I'm not going to delve into his soul. I don't know what his relationship to God is, but he's obviously not a devout religious person. I would rather have an atheist stand with a Bible in front of a uh, church than have a bunch of people burn the church down. I didn't hear any outrage from that, from these same people about that. These are cities, you know, the Wall Street Journal said this today, these are cities that have in common that they are led by Democrats who seem to have bought into the belief that the police are a bigger problem than rampant disorder. They are either cowed by their party's left or they agree that America is systematically racist and rioting is a justified expression of answer against it. You know, much worse than the looters. The looters are thugs. The looters are criminals. Antifa, bad, but the media is the worst. All right, the mailbag is coming up, but... But in order to be in next week's mailbag, you have to be a subscriber. And if you're going to be a subscriber, you should be an all access subscriber. If you are an all access subscriber, you get incredible things. We drive you around town. We, you know, come and clean your house. We don't do any of that, but we will give you two leftist (laughs) tears tumblers. These things are handcrafted, solid gold, diamond encrusted pieces of plastic that (laughs) you can drink leftist tears out of until the cows come home. And hopefully they're coming home somewhere somewhere else because there's probably not a lot, lot of room for cows in your house. So what you want to do is you want to go over <laughs> you want to go over to dailywire.com/subscribe and again let us let, let us let's try and make this a theme not just not just of this show. I mean the theme of the show save the clave and that is a theme, but I want to make you to make this a theme in your life that you want my subscriptions to be higher than Noel's, both on the YouTube channel and in the subscriptions. If you go on to dailywire.com slash subscribe, you can join all access and get 15% off with the coupon code Clavin, K-L-A-V-A-N, no E's, K-L-A-V-A-N. If you subscribe with that, not only do you get the two leftist tears tumblers and all the great services of the mailbag and the de- and the backstage and getting to ask questions on backstage, but you get the moral satisfaction of knowing you have not let Noel get more subscribers than me. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing because he does. He has Russian bots. He has Chinese people, you know, subscribing. You've got to get out there as Americans, as Americans and subscribe under my name. (laughs) We'll take the Chinese people. Yeah, but he's using spies. I meant those, you you know who I'm talking about. He's many, you know, the guys from Wuhan who's spreading the disease. Those are the people. (laughs) But but come on over to dailywire.com and subscribe. We've got the peaceful mailbag coming up, setting your world on fire. All right, mailbag. That's just what I was going to say. All right. So a lot of you were ticked off that I didn't scream at Jonah Goldberg, right? He comes on and, you know, why why didn't I really fight with him and debate him? Why don't I destroy him? Those capital things that we do on YouTube, I destroy Jonah Goldberg. Uh, Here's one. I'll read just a little bit from a lady named Marge. Uh, She says, I feel like I've sent you so many flaming emails that were on a first name basis. The beginning of today's show was awesome. You were a flame looking for a stick of dynamite, my favorite version of you. However, when you started the segment, with Jonah the whale, I had to start skipping through that sanctimonious POS is exactly what you first st- spent the first part of the show uh, railing against. So why do we have to listen to him in person? A lot of this. I got a lot of it. So here, here's my philosophy. I mean, you know, you can take it or leave it. Here's my philosophy. You hear from me every show. I, you know what I think. I will try to explain it. I take, I take, I have taken a lot of risks to bring you what I think is the truth. I have taken a lot of risks, and I've, and I've gone through a lot of sacrifice. I've given up a lot of things that I like in life, so I can sit here and talk to you the way I'm talking to you. When I get a guy like Jonah, whom I know and respect, and I know his work and respect his work, and I know him to be a man of integrity and conscience, right? I know he's a guy with a conscience, and and in expressing the things he's expressed, he has done a lot of what I've done. He's taken a lot of sacrifices. He's taken a lot of professional hits for do, for saying what he says and doing what he does, okay? I strongly disagree with him. As I told him to his face, as I've told you before he came on, and I'm telling you now, I strongly think he's got the wrong end of the elephant. I really do. I think the problem is the media and the narrative and that we have to fight that, and Trump is actually not the problem. Trump is, could be part of the solution, despite his flaws, which we both agree he has, okay? 
When I bring him on, I bring him on because I want to know why he is saying something that I disagree with. I'm not bringing him on to destroy him. I'm not even bringing him on to debate him. I challenge him because I want to hear what he thinks. I thought he did a good job of defending his position, even though I disagree with him, but he sees himself in a different place. He sees politics in a different way than I do. He sees himself sort of above the fray, supplying uh, ideas and ideology for the fray. And as he says, he's politically homeless, but he knows what his ideology is. And he certainly is not a hypocrite. He hasn't changed his mind. I see it more like a brawl that we have to fight the fight. We have to be on our, our own side and we have to win. He sees that as carrying water for a party. I, you know, I don't. I mean, I, I will hit the Republicans. I will hit Trump if I have to, but in the context of that brawl. So we disagree. Do you want, what do you want me to do? Do you want to not hear anyone you disagree with on your side? The people who want the same things you want? You don't want to think, hey, let me run through my arguments against this guy and know why I think what I think. You don't want to think, well, wait a minute, maybe he said one thing there that is true. Maybe he made a good point here or there. I, I don't understand that. I do not understand talking just to defeat the opposition. That's how you get stupid. That's how the left got stupid. They never listen to what we're saying. They never tune us in. They don't know who we are. They don't know what we think. They didn't know who the Trump voters are. They still don't know. I want to know when a guy who disagrees with me, who I know has integrity, who I know has a conscience, who I know has suffered for what he says and has taken the hit for what he says, I want to know what he thinks. I want to give him a chance to, to explain it to me. That seems to me the only point in talking to people. Frankly, if I brought a leftist on, I'd let him talk too. You know what I think. I hate it when they bring me on shows and just yell at me. They, that's happened to me. I tell them I'm not coming back on. It's not worth my time. Why shouldn't we listen to them? The left won't come on the show because they're afraid. They're afraid because nobody asks them any questions. But I'd let them talk. I would let them talk. So I don't, I don't know what to say. It's a different philosophy of talking to people. I want to know what they think. I want to hear the, what they think. And I want to go through in my own mind my arguments against them and see. But I can't do that until I hear their best expression of what they have to say. And that's what I try to get out of them. All right, let's do a video uh, question. We'll take the one from Robert. From Robert in North Carolina. Like you are, I am an evangelical Christian, and I had the privilege of being able to grow up reading some of your young adult novels, such as the Mind War series, such as the Homelanders, and the list can go on for the ones you've written. Um, I'm also trying to write fiction novels that still have Christian elements without going so into the emotionalism that I see in you know some of the modern day Christian fiction books. I was interested if, to see if you had any um, advice that you could give to young writers who are hoping to write and publish um, a book. So thank you for your time. Um, hope you see this. Figured you're the most accomplished of the four in the Daily Wire to answer this and save the Clayton. Thank you. <laughs> Save the Claven, indeed, that is the most that is the most important thing. We should not let that slip from the center of our minds. Um, OK, well, Robert, thanks. And uh, and thank you for reading the books. And I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, to answer the specific part of your question about uh, writing fiction with a Christian bent, you know, I would start out leaving. You, you, you have two choices how to do this without being garbage Christian fiction. OK, there are two ways to do this, I think. One is to not write about Christianity, but to write about about a Christian in a situation, to describe things as they are, as they happen, as they really do happen. Even if you're doing a fantasy novel, you can describe things the way they happen. Let the guy be a Christian and react as a Christian, but don't make him the voice of the novel. Just make him a character in the novel. Make your protagonist, uh, your lead character, a Christian, and let him express that voice. That's what I did in The Homelanders. I didn't take uh, a Christian attitude, but I did write about a Christian character and let him have his way. The other thing you can do is take Christianity out of it altogether and simply write about a world that is the world that we live in. If you write about the world that we live in, if you write honestly about the world that we live in, and if there is a God, and if Jesus Christ is his son, he will shine through the truth. He does in real life. I don't see why he wouldn't in real life fiction. And that's why I'm not afraid to write things that Christians don't like. That's why I'm not afraid to say, to write about lust and about evil and about the good guys winning and the bad guys winning sometimes. I'm not afraid to write about all of that because that is re the real world. And I believe God is the God of the real world. So, you know, in that, in the, to deal with that specific question, uh, you know, either write about a Christian in the world, in the real world, 
or just write about the real world with as much honesty as you can so that people see why you believe in what you believe. I mean, they, you can tell stories that show why you believe. Like I said, I always look at The Sopranos, which has nothing but evil in it, and yet preaches God, even if he didn't mean to, even if he didn't mean to do that, it preaches God by showing you what evil is and showing you how it, it essentially sucks the soul out of people and sucks uh, the goodness out of life. It, it's, a, it's a brilliant show for that reason. So just, just be honest. I mean, that is you know the truth will set you free. On other things, as I say to everybody, you got to read all the time, read the kind of book you want to write, read Read great books that you, that are not the kind of books you want to write, but are great, so you can learn how to do that and learn your grammar, man. That is the biggest thing of all. Get a book about grammar and read it from beginning to end. Do all of the exercises because that's your that's your toolkit. Um, from Robbie, I'm hearing a lot of comparisons of the Boston Tea Party to this looting that's going on right now. What are your thoughts? Well, if it is the Boston Tea Party. Uh, I don't think it is. I do not think it is. But if it is, it's a revolution. And the answer to a revolution is that the the army has to come and fight the revolutionaries. I don't think they're going to like that so much. I don't think they want to make that comparison. I don't want to make that comparison. Uh, A country, a a group of patriots uh, revolting against uh, a country that was governing them without representation has nothing to do with this. These people have representation. They can take political action. This looting and burning is not political action. It is anti-political action. You take political action when you want to bring down the government. If you want to bring down the government, the full force of the government should be brought against you. I don't think that that's a very good excuse. From Keith, uh, he says, I'm missing something. This is a long thing. I'll have to edit it. I'm missing something. I've decided to leave Christianity behind, at least in the form it's presented to me. I tried praying constantly and reading the Bible and begging for the spirit to live in me and change my ways to no avail. The only reason I've stuck with it is punishment. I don't think anyone deserves hell. I don't care how horrible they are. Adolf Hitler can't God show him the atrocities through the eyes of the people he killed and break that spirit uh, because deep down I'm just as bad as Hitler. I never got an option to avoid all this. I'd rather not have been made, never born, never given a 99.99% chance of hell. Um, I've done therapy. I've done all kinds of stuff, desperate to get this spirit or get this change, and it hasn't happened, so I am damned. My question is, what am I missing? Why do we need saving, and why does it have to be voluntary? (laughs) Why can't God just show himself and help? I can't force myself. uh, And... As much as I read the Bible, it appears to me to be conform or be tortured forever. God appears cruel and evil to me. Why make people come to him in fear of hell rather than out of love for everything he's done? I'd rather be unexisted than anything else right now. Well, all I can say from my point of view, uh, Keith, is that you got some bad Christianity. I mean, that's not Christianity. It's, it's just not. It may be somebody's Christianity. It may be something that somebody's preaching to you. It may be the way you've been taught to read the Bible, but it's not what the Bible actually says. All of this stuff about deep down you're just as bad as Hitler, I get that. I mean, deep down we're all twisted and sick. I mean, I'm looking right at you and I'm telling you I'm the same way. I've got all the thoughts you have. I've got all the things, struggle with all the things. Christianity is that you're forgiven. You are forgiven for that. God knows that. He's got that from the get-go. You're not damned for that. You're not damned because of that, right? If you accept that forgiveness, if you accept that forgiveness in Jesus, you're done. You're done. You don't have to do that. Now, 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 how are you going to behave? What does that mean? What does that mean to believe uh, that that is what God is? What God is is this forgiving, loving person who understands the person you want to be. Because the person you want to be, the person you know, you're, you, you're tortured by what's in you. Why are you tortured by what's in you? You're tortured by what's in you because you know there's another person that you can be that you're not, right? I know that too. There's another person I could be that I'm not. So if you are striving, moving toward that person, you know, struggling to be that person, and that doesn't mean just just suppressing things. It means acting. It means acting to do the good things that you can do in this life, to love the people around you, to encourage the love inside you, to nurture the love inside. The rest, the rest is all, you know, forgiven. It's all forgiven. You're off the hook. They're off the hook. Now, you know, you talk about uh, hell. Really, people send themselves to hell. If you know, and I don't. You don't know anything about judgment. You don't even know if Hitler is in hell. We could guess, but we don't know that Hitler is in hell. We don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about the judgment of God, except that it's going to be perfect. That's the only thing we know. It's going to be perfect judgment with perfect mercy. Okay? That's what you know. That's what you trust in. That's what you rely on. Why does God make you do this in a voluntary basis? Well, think about that in real life for a minute. How would you like it if you woke up and I was standing over you with a gun to your head saying, if you don't do the right thing, I'm going to blow your brains out. That's not life. 
That is not life. That is not how you become yourself. You can only become yourself by doing good voluntarily. You can only become yourself by living into your best self voluntarily. You got to do it that way. There is no other way. I mean, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make any sense. It's really talking nonsense. So look, you're not 99.99% going to hell. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You're already forgiven. Take the gift. Take the gift. It's being given to you. Stop complaining. You know, it's like it's just being handed to you on a platter. All you have to do is say, thank you, Lord. I appreciate it. Now live into that vision of yourself. Live into that vision of yourself that God sees, that God knows is there. Because for all he knows your sin, for all he knows your Hitlerian tendencies, he also knows who he made you to be. He also knows that person who is tortured by those tendencies, who is striving to get past those tendencies. He knows that guy. He's with that guy. He's got his hand in the hand of that guy hoping to lead you into that guy if you just let him, if you just let him. You, you've got some bad Christianity. You're not, you're not thinking about this right. Uh, I'm a, I know I'm a little over, but I'm going to do one more. Um, this is from Lindsay. Uh, says, I recently watched a segment where you had your son come on and talk about his podcast, and you were just so similar to the two of you and so in sync with uh, one another that it triggered something in me. My own relationship with my dad is rocky at best. And she goes on. Uh, she says, My question is, was there ever a topic that you and your son couldn't openly discuss? And if so, how did either of you skirt around it without offending the other? She's talking about political differences she has with her father. Again, I know the relationship is different, or at least I can hope it is, but I found that the best insights come from real people who have achieved what I hope to achieve, especially if they get to that point unknowingly. Uh, Stay safe, watch out for Karen, and I hope you get to go to a ball game soon. Uh, Well, look, between two people, there are always things you don't want to talk about. There are things that you shouldn't talk about. There are private things or personal things or things that, uh, you know, my, in my son's life that maybe he thinks are none of my business and all that's fine with me. I think you're, what you're referring to is you're referring to are there topics we avoid because they're a source of, uh, argue, uh, of hostility between us. And the answer to that, I hope and believe, is no. I don't think there are topics we avoid. And one of the reasons, okay, is because the way I talk to people is not to defeat them, not to convince them, not to change their mind, but to hear them and address them, just like I did with Jonah Goldberg. You know, I, I'm not, I don't bring Jonah on to defeat him. I don't bring him, bring him on to beat him. I don't talk to my son that way. I don't talk to my daughter that way. I don't even talk to my wife that way, though I'm sure she, she thinks I sometimes do. I'm not trying to change them. I want them to be who they are. So that means you can talk about anything, but it takes two. It takes two, right? You can't have one person being open and letting somebody else express their opinion and the other telling them that they're evil and I'm not talking to you and you stink and just screaming at you. If my son were doing that to me, I wouldn't be talking to him about those subjects. But he's not doing that to me, so I'm not doing it to him. And that's a good way that you can talk about anybody, anything, but it takes two people. It takes two people, right? I mean, my attitude toward my kids was I wanted them to be themselves. I knew that they were not going to be the things that maybe, you know, maybe it would have given me pleasure if they had done A, B, or C. I, I never made that my ambition. I never made that my ambition. Their, their purpose in life is not to make me happy, though they do. They both make me extremely happy, but that's not their purpose in life. Their purpose in life is just what I was talking about to the last guy, is to become that version of themselves God made, to get as close into that version of themselves. It's kind of like where this little shriveled thing, like the guys in, uh, what was it, the Little Mermaid or Buried in the Dirt, where this little shriveled thing, but we're surrounded by this beautiful, uh, golden, lighted thing that God made us to be. And the idea is to sort of push that shriveled thing and make it bigger and bigger until it comes as close as we can get it to fitting into that golden thing God made. So so that's my attitude toward my kids. And if they bring me something that I disagree with or something uh, that I think is wrong, you know, they're going to hear from me. I'll tell them if I think they're doing something wrong. And hopefully I've lived the kind of life where they think, hey, that guy is not a dummy. He's not out to hurt me. He's out to help me. Uh, and therefore they'll listen. But again, there's nothing they can't talk to me about, nothing they can't bring to me. And uh, as long as they treat me like that, then they'll, there's nothing I can't bring to them. Takes two. All right. I got to stop there, but I will be back again tomorrow. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. 
If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. 